Okay. It's a center we have in Anshadi. Okay. It's a study business. It's a survey. It's a survey. Asking people what they thought about a lot of things, including... You never took too much space. You're nice. I think we'll get started. So if those in the back would come forward, there are a few seats up here, and uh, I know we're expecting more, but uh, we have to observe our time commitment so that those who have to go on to other events may do so. I'm Carla Hills, and I have the, uh, uh, the honor and the pleasure of co-chairing the Inter-American Dialogue. And I have to tell you that uh, I am extraordinarily honored today to uh, have here at the table a man who courageously led the effort to remove the brutal military regime of President Pinochet and to end the dirty war that beset uh, Chile from uh, the 1973 coup to the 1988 national plebiscite. Now, his book, which I strongly recommend, it is a terrific book, The Southern Tiger, Chile's Fight for Democratic and a Prosperous Future, is uh, eloquently sets forth the economic, political, and security challenges faced by the opposition that he so skillfully led. Exiled, imprisoned, and <laughs> regularly threatened, President Lagos was a relentless, and fearless in building a center-left coalition that brought down a dictator and brought back democracy to Chile. After President uh, Pinochet uh, stepped down, President Lagos did not uh, uh, seek to run for president. Instead, he served as Minister of Education in President Alwyn's administration and, there, and somewhat later served as Minister of Public Works in President Frey's administration. So it wasn't until the year 2000 that he ran and he won the presidency. And the focus of his administration was to create jobs, to build infrastructure, to establish a good health plan, and to open markets. And while he was president, he signed trade agreements with the United States, South Korea, China, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, and Brunei, and uh, his success in putting Chile on the right track economically and politically greatly improved the, the livelihood and the lives of his fellow Chileans, a fact that is well documented by the 70% approval rating that he earned at the end of his presidency. Trained as a lawyer in Chile, and getting a Ph.D. in economics at Duke University here in the United States. He is experienced in dealing with tough economic and uh, political challenges, and he has produced a uh, magnificent account of the challenges that confronted Chile in the 80s, challenges that have great relevance today as people around the globe are demanding a greater say in shaping their economic and, and political futures. And we're also honored to have at this table with us Thomas McClarty, most commonly known as Mac, who serves as vice chair of the Inter-American Dialogue. He served as President Clinton's uh, chief of staff, counselor, special envoy for the Americas, and a member of the National Economic Council. And Mac was a key player in ensuring the passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement and in pressing for a free trade area for the America, free trade agreement for, for the Americas. And he was awarded the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Medal by Secretary Madeleine Albright and the Order of the Aztec Eagle by uh, President uh, Ernesto Zedillo, and that is the highest civilian award that the Mexican government gives to a foreign dignitary, as I would say Mac is. 
but is the government service started at an early age after graduating from the uh, uh, University of Arkansas. He was elected to the Arkansas State Legislature at the age of 23. And in the mid-20s, he became chairman of his state's Democratic Party. He also has a successful uh, record in business in addition to running his family companies and serving on a number of boards. He has created a highly respected uh, consulting firm, McClarty Associates, headquartered here in Washington, D.C. Now, we will ask President Lagos to say a few words about this extraordinary book that he has written, The Southern Tiger, and then we will permit Mac <laughs> McClarty to uh, make some comments uh, before inviting all of you to participate in the program with questions or comments. So it is my pleasure, Mr. President, to ask you if you would just say a few words. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for, for that introduction. And let me tell you that I'm extremely happy to be here, what I consider my house in Washington. <laughs> I, I, I have the honor and the privilege to be co-chairman of the inter and now with Carla. <laughs> and I spent about uh, three and a half years after being president as a co-chairman here. And in, in this uh, year when the Inter-American Dialogue will have uh, 30 years, I think that the role that has been played by this dialogue has been enormous to understanding of uh, Latin American countries and the United States. So I'm happy that uh, uh, Michael Schiff, that the, our actual boss here, <laughs> the former boss is down there, you know. <laughs> But the acting boss to say, why don't you come here and present the book here at the time? <laughs> and I would like to thank for that. And first of all, to explain what this book is not about. <laughs> this book is not about what you can consider a traditional memoir of a former president, when you explain detail <clears throat> by detail, a lot of footnotes of the different different uh, achievements of what you did. No, it's not that. What I tried to do was to present in a very clear-cut way what has been our own experience. First, as Carla says, fighting against Pinochet, and then the other transition that I say, not the transition from dictatorship to democracy, but the other one that normally has not all the the lights and cameras of TV, but the much more difficult transition going from a rather backward economy to a rather modern economy, to a low productivity to a high productivity. How are you going to be dealing with the issue of uh, past violation of human rights to what are you going to do in order to see the future? That's why in order to see the future sometimes you have to address sometimes the issues of the past in order not to repeat those issues again. In other words, what I would like to say is that in the same way that we were able to have a very broad coalition to go to, to defeat Pinochet, then after two or three years we realized that this other transition will be necessary to keep the coalition in order to keep the second transition that was much more difficult than the first one. And sometimes we have a sense that you fulfill everything after you defeat a dictatorship. I would say that this is the first part of the equation, and the second one is a little bit more difficult. And I know that during these days, uh, where well, everybody used to talk about the Arab Spring, well, I would say that the Arab Spring is going to be essential, but to be essential will require at least two conditions. The first, I know it's difficult for the military to go back to the barracks, but if the military would like to participate in politics, they have to take out the uniform, leave the uniform in the barrack, and as a simple citizen participate in politics. And I know also that it's extremely dangerous when you participate in politics 
to address politics from the very high point of view that to, to some extent represent God in planet health. And if you ask the military to leave the uniform in the house, <coughs> I will ask those people with the moral authority to speak on behalf of God <coughs> to leave religion in the church. <laughs> and when you go to participate in politics, then you are just one more citizen and never speak because you are speaking on behalf of God. Why I say this? Because in the Arab Spring, this is going to be the crucial issue in both areas. And therefore, I think that <coughs> there has been the elections in very recently in some of these countries. I, I do think that this is going to be a very essential part of how are we going to be able to build this coalition. After saying that, the only thing that uh, I would like to, to say with regard to <coughs> that probably the book has uh, just one person that appears so much, which is the author. And the other people doesn't appear, but it's the other people that really make possible the book. And when I say this is devoted to the Chilean people, and also, of course, to all those people that work with me, either fighting against Pinochet, either in government, in different places. <coughs> and, but I realized that in a general book like this one, it was going to be very difficult to explain how much I own, particularly when I was in government, I was president, and those that were members in my cabinet, the so-called advisor of the second floor, or the so-called whatever the capacity they held to a president. After saying this, just two comments with regard to the questions of defeating dictatorship. Because today, when you look for Bagua, it's rather easy to realize what we did. But let me tell you that at that moment, it was not easy to realize, because there was a tremendous discussion among people against Pinochet, what was the right road to, re to defeat Pinochet. And if you have a dictatorship that was using armed forces to sustain in that job, then the idea to say, we are going to defeat them also through weapons and arms, was very strong. And to tell them, look, this is not the right way, because if you defeat them with this kind of method, at the end, you may have with another dictatorship. And therefore, till what extent you have to rest in the traditional democratic values of Chilean society that from our point of view, was the most important asset that we have as a country. And therefore, to see that today is rather easy. At that time, was a tremendous infighting, discussions, etc. And at the same time, from our point of view, from the left-wing part of Syrian society, well, socialism has a tremendous tradition of uh, if there are three socialists in the same room, you have three different factions of the socialists. <laughs> and therefore, given that tradition, then there are two tasks to approach simultaneously. Are you going to be able to speak with one voice from the different factions? And number two, once that you have that, are you going to have and being together with Christian Democrats, with members of the Radical Party, of the Liberal Party, or whatever. And if you think that we used to discuss very much in the past, till what extent we are going to realize that the major responsibles of what happened in Chile were the Chileans, because we were unable to agree in many essential parts of what we did. I know that there has been, and somebody asked me yesterday in Georgetown why I didn't mention the straightforward of how important was United States government involvement in the breakdown of democratic Chile. I know that. But that was something that helped, but that was not their reason, which is different, which is different. That was the time of the Cold War. And therefore, at that time, well, white or black, there is no gray. And therefore, it was very clear what happened. But at the same time, let us not forget that 
major responsibility was in our side. And the fact that those that were in favor of change, Christian Democrats that say that there were going to be revolution in liberty, and socialists that say that it's going to be a revolution in a democratic way with Congress working and so on and so forth, we are unable to get together. Probably that was the major element by which the first thing was, are we going to be able to work together? And at least we agree then how we're going to defeat Pinochet, nonviolence, and number two, that probably is going to be necessary if we defeat Pinochet to work together during no more than four years. And then each political party go back to the corner in the <laughs> political ring. And this is when I say then came the second transition and we discovered that we cannot go back to the corner, to the political ring, that we need a very broad agreement and a very broad coalition. And also, let us recognize, because Pinochet was defeated, but Pinochet's political forces got 44% of the vote. So what we have in front of us was an important part of society. After I say this, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, when we arrive finally and we defeat Pinochet, we defeat Pinochet primarily because we were able to convince the Chilean people that through a ballot box, a pencil and a paper, you can do it. As long as we were able to organize ourselves in political parties. I was the idea, because socialists were forbidden, according to Pinochet's constitution, to have just one party, the party for democracy. At the very end, the Christian Democrats decided to register as a party, so the radical parties, so the social democrats. So at the end, the party for democracy that I founded was a party by default, because they had formed their own parties. But what I do think is important is that because all of those parties were able to register according to the system of Pinochet. We had a very good organization, and we were to able to count the votes. And the fact that we won the plebiscite was simply because the Chilean people thought that it was possible to do it that way. And we received at that time many important contributions, among others, from the United States. And if I'm going to say something about the U.S. relation with the United States, what I would say to say is that in the middle of Reagan administration, something changed. George Schultz decided that something has been changed in Chile, and the decision to say, look, I think that these guys, you know, that called themselves Democrats, probably had some reason, had some future, and there was a change in Reagan administration vis-a-vis -vis in the middle of the steel Cold War. Then we have the president, what we did in these 20 years. And very briefly, because it's in the book, the only thing that we knew that we have to do it was a few things that normally are not done in a transition. First, to look back. But to look back in order not to repeat the mistake of the past, or as I used to say, in order not to repeat again those mistakes not are we going to deny today those mistakes. And therefore, if we want to not to repeat, we have to be able to face what we did. And this, I think, is a difficult decision to take. But I think that it's not possible to have tomorrow if you don't face the fact that happened yesterday. And this, I think, was different from some other transitions. But in the long run, I think that this is the only way. Number two, I think that uh, the decision to understand and to carry out what has been the uh, trade agreement, so what has been the kind of development that we have, that starts from a very simple conclusion. When you are a rather poor country, growth, growth is number one priority. It's true that normally conservatives would like to put emphasis in growth. Those rosy socialists would like to put emphasis in distribution. I think that both two things are wrong. 
to have growth without distribution or just distribution without growth in the long run. It's not possible to sustain a society like that. And the question is, how are you going to be able that very narrow road where if you put too much emphasis in distribution, then probably investment is going to go, go, go back. And if you don't have enough investment, growth in the future will not work anymore. And if you put too much emphasis in growth without distribution, some social explosion may emerge. So I say this is very easy to say, very difficult to carry out this very thin road. Number two, when you are talking about a country rather small like Chile, with a small market, then it's quite different from some other countries like Brazil that is almost a continent. And therefore, the way that you behave vis-a-vis -vis free trade, it may be different. Because if you're going to have access to bigger market, and the market that you have is such a small, that probably is very difficult to, to have similar political ways to face free trade. I can understand that. And the only thing that I say to my Brazilian friends at that moment of time in my lamentation was, we have to have trade agreement with Europe, United States, and Asia, because we want to, to have an export-led growth. It's different when the, your market is so huge that is enough with what you have. And that is why I think that to have a free trade of the America, a free trade of the America has to be something that is going to be built with a variable geometry because one size doesn't fit all. If you are talking with the Caribbean countries where about uh, what? In some cases, 40% of fiscal income is tariff. Tariff apply on products coming from the United States or those Caribbean islands. And you talk with them about the free trade. They are not going to worry about free trade because the industry is going to disappear. What is going to disappear is fiscal income. And therefore, you have to think in what ways you are going to replace fiscal income coming from tariff to fiscal income coming from taxes. And that will take some time. And therefore, you need to to understand that issue. And that is why I think that sometimes our uh, effort to have some kind of better integration in Latin America has been because integration from the economic point of view has to make room for this difference between different countries. That's the secret of the Europeans. Well, I know it's not good to talk today about the Europeans as an example. <laughs> but, let me say, but let me say, you know, that in the long run, run they have been able to have a European Union, and here you have then the UK without being part of the Euro, and you have some others, you know, that not, we are not part of NATO or whatever you want to say. So some kind of uh, variable geometry may, may help a little bit. Now to, to conclude, and this is an epilogue in, in the book that I, I did in, it's just one page that I mentioned that. How is that this uh, so-called Southern Tiger uh, had the problem that uh, all of you know we had during the last year, 2011. And I would say, first, those students that were on the streets were being born in 1990. They have a beautiful uh, uh, slogan. They are afraid of us because we are not afraid of anybody. And I agree. They are not afraid of any other because they live in a democratic country. Past generation, well, they were afraid. I have a story in the book about that. Number two, I would say, what happened during these 20 years is that our policies, public policies, social policies, were quite successful. And because we are successful, we changed the country. And what was used to be a country with 40 percent, well, the number, uh, the number one item in the agenda is poverty. But if you are only 13 or 14 percent of poverty, well, still you have to address poverty. But then the question of distribution of income is becoming much more important. And if you allow me to go a little bit further, the question of 
per capita income growing is extremely important to solve social and economic issues. And it's a very close correlation, depending on public policies, of course. When you increase per capita income from 5,000 to 15,000, well, needless to say that social and economic indicators will improve. But, and this is a huge but, after $20,000, $22,000 per capita income, this close correlation between higher per capita income <laughs> and better social and economic indicators began to make a little bit loose. And you may have a country <clears throat> like New Zealand with better social and economic indicators like the U.S., in spite of the fact that the gross domestic product of New Zealand and the per capita uh, New Zealand is much more than per capita of the U.S. What I'm trying to say is that the question of distribution of income in more developed countries is becoming essential if you want to believe how are we going to be able to solve those issues. In short, if now, not only in Chile, but quite a number of Latin American countries are approaching the yardstick of the $20,000, if things keep going in the way that they are, According to the IMF figures, Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, perhaps Colombia, in the 2020 or 2022, all those countries are going to be above the 20,000 per capita income. If that is the case, then what kind of distribution they will have? Today's distribution, very poor social and economic indicator we will have in spite of that per capita income. Improving in our distribution, then we may have a better prospect in our own society. In short, I would say that I do believe that the big issue that facing our most developed countries in the region is the question of income distribution. Yes, I know now everybody is talking about income distribution also in developed countries. But let me tell you that I never thought that I was going to see a movement like the 99%. Because I, I found that movement so sophisticated from the point of view of the general population. In a room like this, of course, everybody understands what is the 99% and who is the 1% and why the share of the 1% has increased so much that has increased at the expenses of the 99%. But to explain that to the general public, my goodness, is quite difficult. Probably, and I would like to conclude with this, that has something to do with something called internet, <laughs> the new uh, technical, geological platform? Till what extent now that kind of discussion, you know, emerge so quick everywhere? And also politicians better to know to understand what that means. Because during 200 years, we have been used to, as leaders of political parties, to send our message, to emit our message, brilliant, of course. And every four years, every six years, people will go to the ballot and will give you a good mark or bad mark. But still, you are the one to emit the message. Now, you go both ways. You emit your brilliant message, and at least in my case, unfortunately, 200 Twitters will say that disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, I admit, but they also admit. And for the first time, citizens are receivers and emitters of message. How this is going to change political institutions, I do not know. But I'm sure that this will change in the same way that democracy was possible because Gutenberg invented the press. Without the press, you have no general. Without generals, mm -hmm. only the king mm -hmm. and his or her cabinet will know what are the public issues in that kind of society. Because you have a paper, then everybody knows what are the issues in that society and everybody can discuss and to make a decision. But now that things are going to change, I do believe that it's going to be different things. In short, I would like to conclude saying that what is the book is not about. 
And finally, a short remark. I learned the hard way uh, what is to publish books in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and they told me, what a mistake, you know, you just signed the contract. And you didn't say, I'm the owner of the title, because I have a different title. But they decided that the Southern Tiger was a, such a beautiful. <laughs> now, since here, the, those that edit the book with me are in this room, I would like to say that whatever the language is good <laughs> is because they are very good. And also I would like to say that they were able to write the chapters in a little bit different way that I did. And this is the reason why sometimes they have titles like, uh, instead of foreign policy, and I spoke about foreign policy in a brilliant way, <laughs> instead of that, they put a different title. Bush, Saddam, and me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, look, I cannot, I cannot accept that unless you accept that a footnote is going to be necessary. And then there is a footnote in that chapter that explains exactly how important was the, the role that we play among the big players. A very small role that was very well defined in a playwright that was being uh, given in London at the time of the Iraq war. And a friend of mine that was in London, I go back to Chile and say, Mr. President, you know, you are an important figure in a play right now being in London. Oh, don't tell me what I do. Well, you have a brilliant path, you know. Just one word. You just say no. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, and who is in my role? And say, I have no idea because you don't appear. How is that that don't appear? <laughs> no, 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 because you there is a voice that said no to President Bush talking on the phone. <laughs> so, well, that's uh, the way that we did and, in that occasion. And uh, nevertheless, I, I understand that, of course, the chapter probably is going to get more readers with that title than with a title like Foreign Policy. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned a lot that uh, better I listen to that. And, and therefore, uh, next time I write a book in English, I will make sure that the title is the one that I would like to have, but I'm planning to give the co-editors of this book in order to have the good ideas that they have. Well, thank you very much, and thanks again for the Inter-American, and for having Carla here, and so I'm glad that. And that time of Iraq, he make also some recollections, some he will recognize some part that he played in the book. Yeah, <laughs> and thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Mac, I'll say a few words. Well, I am uh, certainly reminded, Mr. President, with the wiseness and thoughtfulness, freshness, creativity, uh, great, great sense of humor, why it is such an honor for me to participate in today's program as a member of the Dialogue Board. Uh, Madam Chairman, it's uh, always good to be with you, and I don't think anyone has a more exemplary and redeeming record in public service than Carla Hills and continues to be such a, a force for good both here in our country and around the world and it's always a great pleasure to, to work with her. Uh, Michael Shifter, thank you for your leadership and strong voice and Peter Hakem, thank you for your dedicated work for so many years and the legacy you leave. As I noted, I have been privileged to be on the dialogue board for a number of years. I think it has a unique place in hemispheric relations. Uh, and I, I mean that quite sincerely, and of course it's an honor to be here today with President Lagos. It's an incredible story of an incredible journey of a country uh, where Ricardo Lagos has played a singular role in that journey, despite his modesty today, as all of you know. I think one of the themes that the President alluded to today is what I would call the real impact of sustained leadership, it, it truly makes a difference. And you can see it in the Eowyn Bray Lagos 
Bocciolet, Pinera, tenures. And the ability, as the President spoke about so eloquently, to build a consensus, to gain the trust and confidence of the people that you represent, if that's done over a period, an extended period, rather remarkable results can be achieved. Always work ahead, but rather significant results that all of you know about quite well because so many people here are friends and people whom I've worked with and admired over the years and have been so uh, supportive of, of me and so engaged in hemispheric relations. And I think it's fair to say that Chile in many ways has been at the forefront of that emerging market, that emerging country, not only in the region but the world, and it's in many ways set some very positive, concrete examples about how government can play a proper role, a forceful and effective role in making democracy work. That's quite important. It's quite important today as our world changes. It's quite important to our country who've been trying to get this democracy perfected for 200 plus years and I think are still working at it rather diligently and, and hard, sometimes effectively, sometimes not. My uh, <clears throat> first encounter, or one of my first encounters with President Lagos was in New York at a luncheon that David Rockefeller hosted for a small group of business people when a socialist candidate was running for president in Chile. <laughs> And a true Rockefeller Republican in this gathering in New York had, shall we say, some skepticism about this left of center, perhaps far left of center candidate in their minds. So there was just a little tension in the air at that luncheon, as I recall it. I was still having the opportunity to be in government at the time in the Clinton administration. So I was a bit anxious myself exactly how I would play this particular endeavor. Well, I must tell you, not unlike today, by the time candidate Lagos had concluded his comments, he had everyone just about in the palm of his hand. He had certainly lowered skepticism and fears, and in large measure had captured a good measure of support in that audience. Now, my opportunity to be supportive came earlier than I anticipated. I actually walked out with candidate Lagos Again, I was a member of the administration, got kind of caught there in a camera clutch. But I was so persuaded, Mr. President, while I did not endorse you, I said some very nice things about <laughs> you right there to the Chilean press. So I want to go on record today. I deserve some measure of credit for your election <laughs> in Chile. <laughs> but it was a heartfelt, uh, genuine feeling, and certainly my positive feelings were more than fully warranted. Of course, I had known of the work of Ricardo Lagos before that. The first time we met when he was Minister of Education, he'd done so much to reimagine the educational system there. Early childhood training, performance-based teachers, all of these things that were truly cutting edge during that period that now have become much more broadly known in our country and around the world. And prior to that, as Carla noted, Minister of Public Works, the creative way he formed, launched, financed infrastructure modernization and reform, something that's a very current topic today in Chile, in other countries in Latin America, and in our own country. The point is, Ricardo Lagos has a proven record over many years of getting things done, not just having bold, broad, creative, fresh ideas, but the ability to put them forward, build a consensus, get them done, and they're having an impact in lifting the lives of people in their everyday affair. And that's largely what government is about in many ways. I was privileged to return with General, uh, Attorney General Janet Reno to your inauguration in 2000 to be part of our U.S. delegation. I saw firsthand his efforts there, and I think it's you, you got a sense of it today, and many of you have known President Lagos over the years. He, he really is more concerned with ideas than ideology, and I think that's been one of the hallmarks of his success. 
I also had a rare and unique experience when we met after I left government on the West Coast where he was attracting capital from Silicon Valley to Chile. And he was kind enough, after a very successful conference, we were both going to President Fox's historic inaugural in Mexico. So President Lagos, in kind of Bill Clinton-like style, asked me to travel with him on Chile's Air Force One to Mexico City. Which is much more than that. Not much, not much. <laughs> it's a Boeing 737. And I must admit, I was missing presidential aircraft by this time, so I gladly took him up on his offer. But the highlight of that evening was not just a direct flight to Mexico City, but when we had dinner there, the president was kind enough to include me with then Senator Pinera, as I recall it. And here were the three of us talking. I was quite honored to be a part of the conversation, but two great leaders of different political persuasions, yet talking about how they could solve problems, address issues, both in their own country, in the region, and more broadly. Again, putting uh, partisanship, politics aside, and getting things done. But I do think it's important that in your book, Mr. President, you write about the particular dishonor of being still the most unequal in terms of income disparity. You talk about that very candidly. You talked about it today. You talk about the hope that young people have in Chile for this quest for social justice. And you make a very powerful statement when you say we must never forget the stakes are high because they are measured in the dignity of human lives. That's at the very core of your ideals and beliefs and something that I think we could take to heart here, certainly in our country. Finally, and <clears throat> Ambassador Hills and I were talking about this earlier, in your chapter, in final chapter, you described having dinner with the former president of Colombia, Belisario Betancourt, and how he said to you, Ricardo, I have a great discovery that I would like to share with you. There is life after the presidency, but there's also bad news. The life after the presidency is a good life, but the bad news is that first you have to be president. <laughs> well, I think my reaction to that is you were a great president, you were a great former president, and you've written a truly great book and a very timely book. And it's frankly rather rare to make comments about someone who can truly be described as a good man and a great man. I think that's what I'm privileged to do today. So congratulations on your book. Thank you for all that you have done and all that I know you will continue to do. Ambassador Hills, I yield the floor back to you. Well, you've heard two wonderful presentations by two wonderful people. We'd like to bring you into the conversation. If you have a question, I just ask that uh, you raise your hand and uh, when recognized that you state your name and affiliation so President Lagos knows to whom he's speaking. And I saw a hand go up right there. Please. Thank you very much. President Lagos, I'm Diane LaVoy. The, the mic, there's the mic. There's the mic, thanks. I currently work for the uh, Department of Homeland Security, but I think most people in this room who do know me know me from other things that I've done with regard to Latin America. I have wanted to ask you, since La Campaña del No, the other side, um, about a feature that I think is very contemporary, and that's humor. Would you say something about the choice? About that? Humor, comic, the comic in life to use that as a major feature in something so important as a plebiscite. I think it was amazing. There's a poster what? in my house what? that is still one of the funniest posters. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have got to that issue. I think that we got many comments uh, from many, many different angles. And of course, if for the first time you are going to have access to TV, at that time it was 15 minutes during the last 30 days of the campaign, 
Then we were tend to tell everybody what has been forbidden during those uh, 15 years. And people are smarter than us say, look, if you do that, people is going to be afraid <laughs> because you will say so many things that has taken place during those 15 years that they will say, no, 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 I'm afraid of going to vote. And the decision was to make a rather happy with some humor. And the idea was uh, the joy is coming. Alegría ya viene. <laughs> and let me tell you an anecdote. On the second day of the campaign, I was making campaign in the extreme south of Chile, in the towns of the Patagonia, in Aysén. And at the moment of my speech, I say yes, because la alegría ya viene. And in the second day of the TV spot, everybody in that faraway corner of the world start thinking that. I mean, the power of that campaign was so powerful, simply because they were used to listen to what was in the campaign of the sea during 15 years, though there was nothing new. What was really new was the campaign for the no and in the way that was presented. And I think that uh, that was a, a big tribute to those that uh, fulfilled the campaign. After saying this, I know that the movie is, has been done about that uh, period of time, and they say that we won simply because our publicists were better. <laughs> I have a tremendous respect for our publicists, but I think that we won because of the people gave the confidence to, to all those leaders that, of that time. But I do think you know, that that campaign was really very good, and I have been told that in some uh, schools, they use the campaign as a typical successful story of how to present your own views. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I have lots of hands right here first. And if you haven't turned off your phone, would you do so? Because it does affect the uh, communications. I'm Bertolt Bynes, former representative and economic advisor of the Inter-American Development Bank. Mr. President, coming where you come from, Politically, how were you able, in a very polarized situation, with a very formidable opposition of 44%, as you mentioned, to connect productively with the private sector, with the banking sector in your country, that normally might have a better connection or a stronger connection with forces on the right of, of the scale? How were you able to to basically cross that bridge and to pull those very important sectors into your policy framework? Well, it's, uh, let me tell you, it was not uh, so much easy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in Chile, the president has to go once a year to a meeting of the very important, most prominent business people. In my campaign, I say to the small and medium, why don't you do something similar? And I went during the six years of my president to six different meetings with the small and medium. But with regard to the, to the large one, I remember that in the first period of the second year of my administration, the leaders of the business association said, Mr. President, leave us to work quietly <laughs> to improve this country. It was real, very bad. And I remember that I told them, I'm coming from a military exercise in another part of Chile. And I am so much surprised because I thought that was going to be much easier to be in good tent with you rather than with the military, <laughs> but has been the other way around. But what I try to do is, let me put this way, a president is the major communicator in the country by definition. Nobody can do it better than him or worse than him, but because he is the one that is going to be in the news uh, every night in your home. And I tried to explain them. <coughs> we wanted to have growth. We wanted to have uh, open our trade. And it's one thing to sign a trade agreement, but it's a different thing that the trade agreement means a sign of excellence which signed the trade agreement with the European Union 
but not a single slaughterhouse passed the test of the European Union. Huh? So we got a quota, very important for us in terms of meat, but not a single pound of meat can go to Europe given the kind of slaughterhouse that we have to, you see? So this means, look, sir, if we want to export, we are going to need to have together. If you want to export fruit, well, you have the guys coming, you know, from Europe to see if the pesticides are so many feet away from where the trees are planted. Because this is the requirement in Europe. The big people knew that. The smaller farmers did not. So how are you going to do that work? Number two, if you want to compete abroad, you need to have a decrease in social tensions. If you have social tensions, then you're going to have internal fighting. And I do not know any country that is able to compete abroad if social tensions emerge internally. And I guess that at the end, it was possible to understand that we define a, an, a common agenda for growth. And uh, it was possible to, to understand to each other. Now, sometimes you didn't get very well with your own people. When I decided to have a program in highways in Chile with a toll system, through building, operate, and transfer. I was in Germany, and a friend of mine, member of the parliament, social democrat, the SPD, say, how is that uh, you are doing that? And I say, because I don't have the privilege of having the taxes that you have here. When you have a 40% of taxes of a gross domestic product in Germany, only 18 in Chile, better I charge some whole system in order to be able to build my own highways. I mean, and then to explain to them, you know. <clears throat> so I think it's a question of uh, dialogue. I'm trying to say the same things when you're talking with the trade union and when you are talking with the, when we came for the trade agreement in the United States, in the room outside where the negotiation were, there was members of the business community, but also were members of the trade union leaders. And when AFLO asked for some, what kind of uh, labor legislation do you have? Well, then our leaders discovered that it was good to have a trade agreement because the question of labor legislation was part of the agenda. So you see, it's, uh, I remember President Bush was very much surprised when he knew that there was members of the, in our delegation, not the official one, of course, of the labor unions. And I tried to explain what was the reason for that. And the same with regard to the, but never to that, there was uh, discussions, of course. When we were discussing with the Europeans, then origins elimination, we used to produce some champagne. Now we produce some spelling, one has some no name. <laughs> the bottle is exactly the same, <laughs> but has no name, you know. You see the bottle and say, well, this is champagne. No, 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 please don't say that word, you know. Uh, but that's the way it was. Yeah. 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 Have a hand here, and then we have a hand over here. Mike. David Crocker, University of Maryland School of Public Policy. You mentioned at the outset the, of the transition from dictatorship, that it was very important to deal with the past, past mistakes. I'd like you to comment on the role of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of reckoning with past wrongs, the different ways in which that was done, also trial and punishment, and whether it contributed to or made it more difficult to bring the kind of conciliation that you're talking about. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question, because I think that this addressed to a very real issue that normally it doesn't too much attention get on that. But in our case, truth and reconciliation was something done by President Elwin, one of the first uh, decisions that he took in his administration, in order to know what happened with those that has been executed and with those that has been disappeared. 
And let me tell you, one that the uh, report was published, the, the findings of the Presidential Commission was a tremendous shock in terms of the country to realize about those three something something Chileans that they did disappear or were executed in a very well military trial, quote unquote. And uh, I think that the, the very moving moment when President Elwin asked pardon to the victims and to the families of the victims on behalf of the Chilean state was a tremendous generosity for somebody that fight the dictatorship, but at the same time that for that was necessary to ask for the pardon. And I faced a similar situation because there was two or three different associations of those that has been political detainees and tortured during detention. And there was an internal discussion in government, what to do with that? Are we going to open the so-called Pandora box? How are you going to be dealing with that? And finally, the decision, and this is the typical decision at the very end, the president is alone. But my decision was to say this, we are going to have a, 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 a presidential commission on that. But you have to be very careful. The presidential commission was to try to establish truth, but not to make justice, which is different. Because to make justice, that is the work of the tribunals. I mean, depend the judiciary power, not the president, not the presidential commission. Number two, we decided that the testimonies at the commission will remain private because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for the people that have been tortured to go there and say, I was raped, I was tortured, I was apply electricity, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you want to make public what you declare at the commission, it's up to you. If you want to make sure that justice is going to make, well, would you please make the same statement that you did in the commission in the tribunal? Why did I say that this distinction is so important? Because when you make the statement, and if somebody asks, me, asks you, and do you know who tortured you? And you say, yes, I know. In cities that are not as used as the capital, in many cases you knew who was the one that tortured you. And you can say, yes, I know, Mr. So-and-so but the Presidential Commission has no authority to call Mr. So-and-so, was not his role. The role of the Commission was to say, yes, you were, a you were a political prisoner. And the fact that now in your uh, life uh, uh, qualifications appear that you have been in jail, that was because there was a dictatorship and you were part of the political persecuted because of your ideas, period. Now, let me tell you, 35,000 Chileans declared the commission. And of those 35,000, 29,000 were recognized as political prisoners. The report is like Dante Aguirre going to the infant. Because the report established what were the major, the major prisons where torture was made. What kind of torture? What kind of torture were made in that particular building? There are some statements. Male, 40 years old, worker in the textile industry, leader of the trade union, and then the statement, but not names, you see. And the decision was that uh, those uh, statements are going to remain private during 30 years. And I get to know that the lady was going to the presidential palace and asked that they want, she wanted to talk with the president. And at the very mm -hmm. end, I, it was so difficult, the question I decided to listen to her. She went to my office and said, Mr. President, I don't accept the 30-year period. 
I need 50 years. But how is that going to be 50 years? Why? And then he says, look, look at me. I'm still rather young, don't you think so? <laughs> yes, of course. I was right when I was 15, several times. And I explained to the commission everything, everything, because this is what happened, and this is my testimony for history. But I hope to be alive when I'm 80. And when I'm 80 years old, I don't want that my grandchildren or grand-grandchildren will know that his grandma was right. It was very difficult to deal with that. And at the end, I decided 50 years. And, and those testimonies are in the memorial of the museum, Museo de la Memoria, that was built by President Bachelet. And many people used to think that that was in order to protect the military. And I said, this is not my question. But the report, as far as I know, is the only one that exists. I remember President Clinton was uh, in Chile after leaving the, his presidency and went to see me, and we talked on this issue. And then he said, Juan, do you put in English? <laughs> So we, uh, the, the executive summary is in English of that report because it's, it's, it's very impressive. And also it's a tribute to what happened in Chile during the dictatorship because one day you were taken to prison, all the family go to the Vicaria, go to some uh, 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 Catholic ch or church-related institutions and present an habeas corpus to the tribunal. The habeas corpus, the only thing that was used to was to say that that was the day when he was detained, you know, because normally no, no, I, I think that during the 60s only one habeas corpus was accepted, and the other 40,000 habeas corpus were rejected. They had no idea. But I, I think that that report on human rights violations in terms of political prison and torture, as far as I know, is one of the few that exist. And of course, the report was made by several people of different political persuasions, and the report came out after a failure of a previous dialogue that was done during the Trump administration. That was the so-called Mesa de Dialogo, and that Mesa de Dialogo has uh, four sides, military, human rights lawyers, institutions of moral standing like uh, churches, and on the other side, uh, members of the different political parties. <coughs> and the decision of that Mesa de Dialogo was to find where are the bodies of those that disappear? And it was very frustrating once that they give the report, they went to find where there were supposed to be the remains of those that disappear, and you only found the small bottoms, a few bones, but the body that has been buried there has been have you say exhumado? Exhumed. Exhumed. Mm -hmm. Must be an exhumed. And in two or three cases, those several bodies have been exhumed and in some other places. And needless to say, was with machines that they took the bodies out and therefore now it's a mix of bones and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a rather tragic thing. And was at that time, after I was president, and I tried to push the, and I talked with the commanders in chief in a very private talk. And I told them it's necessary to find the bodies. Otherwise, it's a kidnap. <laughs> and kidnap is a continuous crime till the moment that appeared the body. And after that uh, talk with them, the commander in chief of the army went to see me. Like you say, privately, that I wanted to see in a private way. I asked to go to my house, my private house. 
And then he told me, Mr. President, you want to know the truth, what happened with many of them? Yes, I say, of course. They are in the ocean. And then I asked him, what did you throw away to the oceans? Person or bodies? And he says, bodies. How many? 200, more than 200. And the report that was presented at the end said all these people were sent to the ocean. Problem. One of those that sent to the ocean, according to the report, a few bonds appear later. So apparently, even in that case, there were some mistakes. So it, to deal with the issue is very <coughs> difficult. But I think that uh, you have to attempt to do it. Otherwise, it will return. Yeah. And all this is in the book, so you can see how compelling it is. We have a hand over here. Uh, my name is Don Planty, Mr. President. I'm a consultant uh, here in town. My real claim to fame, though, is I'm a graduate of the University of Católica de Chile, so I, that's my badge of <laughs> honor. Um, I'd like to ask you, um, in your view, why do you think the concertación model has not been emulated more widely in Latin America? I don't mean the plebiscite and the immediate transition to democracy, and you've made a distinction between the two, but more, you know, the concertación in political terms that brought Chile political stability and economic growth. <clears throat> and the other programs that you mentioned, um, a period of, of stability that allowed the country to really pay attention to its, its issues and avoid falling back to 1970, this backsliding that we see around the region so much. Why hasn't that political model, that political socioeconomic model, been more widely emulated in the region? Well, it's, it's difficult to say if they are or they are not. To what extent what's going on in Brazil represent to some extent some general agreement, even though probably President Lula wouldn't like to recognize that to some extent he <laughs> followed the step of his predecessor in many areas. Um, to what extent what's going on now in Frente Amplio in Uruguay? Or I have been told that President Alan Garcia is planning to be in town this or next week. And I remember that once here in this Inter-American Dialogue, at that time the candidate Alan Garcia came here and said that he was planning to follow what Chile was doing. At least this is what my ambassador told me when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I assume to increase my ego, you know. But but on the other hand, I think that this has to do also with what are the political institutions in, in each particular country. And why I say this? Because, well, if you look to Argentina, Argentina has political parties that are rather unusual simply because the phenomenon of feronism. In some other areas, you know, political party used to be discredited and some of them remain discredited till today. And this is something to worry about in Chile because in Chile the, the figures that we have during the last year is that it's true that President Piñera is not doing very well in the polls and it's going down, but the concertation is also going down. There is no communicating like in Spain, when you have going down, Zapatero, Rajoy was going up. And when both of them are going down, then this is something to worry about because legitimate uh, of uh, political parties or the legitimate is, is dangerous. On the other hand, what is to follow the Chilean model? The Chilean model in terms of economic policies I think that in the region in general, we have learned how to manage our own economies. There is a generation of people that knows how to do those things. 
Now, it's different that in some cases, as I mentioned, politics may be different, the economic policy given the size of the country. And also, in some of the cases, this may be the byproduct of the past, what the past experiences you have and what are you going to do. But for instance, the case that the Latin American's financial system is in good shape to a big extent is because we have had in the past so many financial crises that now, you know, <laughs> well, at least we, we learn from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, I would say that to some extent, I wouldn't say that it's a Chilean model, but probably, well, some common knowledge that has been able. After saying that, I understand that still there are some people that think in, in utopias that belongs more to the past rather than to the future, and are rather unusual to have utopias about the past, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think that fulfills what is supposed to be an utopia. But really, I don't think that those things are, are, are going to be sustainable vis-a-vis -vis the future, really. But uh, I think that Latin American countries will emerge from this crisis much better than we were before. And, and the fact that our problem is that probably now that we have the three of our countries in the G20, <coughs> that if we're going to have some influence, better we try to speak with one language and not three. Probably, if that's possible to do, then we may have a, a, a bigger impact at the world stage because of that. But the leadership of uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, at least in that group, may be very important in order to harmonize our own views vis-a-vis -vis what we can do in our own country. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have one last question right there on the aisle and then give you all a chance to get a book before President Lagos departs, and he might even sign it for you. Uh, Michael Masedek with the PBS NewsHour. Thank you very much for an inspiring uh, afternoon, evening. Uh, you've mentioned various countries in Latin America, but three that you haven't mentioned, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. How do they fit into your construct, given the way the politics and their economic thinking is going at the moment? Well, first of all, I think that in the case of Bolivia, it's important what took place when President Morales was elected, because that was really a change in the political tradition of Bolivia. After saying this, I would say that the way that Morales has been able to deal, particularly with the issue of gas and the price of gas that he exports to Brazil and Argentina has been an important development from the point of view of Bolivia. He was able to raise the price. Uh, <coughs> with regard to Ecuador, uh, President Correa has been able, I would, I would say, to stabilize Ecuador in the sense that now you have a president that is running the country. I know that there is a lot of discussions about what way he is running the country and to what extent, like uh, Hugo Chavez also, the traditional <coughs> division of powers of Montesquieu is being applied in those countries. <laughs> and, 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 and the tendency, the tendency that sometimes uh, probably they haven't talked with Belisario Betancourt, and that's the reason why they would like to remain in power longer. <laughs> because they don't know that there is life after being president. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that uh, to send the Lissario Betancourt and tell me what is that, you know, may be a good idea. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> let me tell you that with regard to Venezuela, with regard to Ecuador, and with regard to Bolivia, in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia, before President Correa and before President Morales, during my six-year term, I spoke with six different <laughs> Bolivian presidents. After saying that, all of them were constitutional presidents because the president has to step down, then the vice president emerged, the vice president has to step down, then the president and the Supreme Court emerged. And so at least, you know, 
the forms, the constitutional forms of the rule of law were respected, which is important, which is important. So I would say probably I don't agree with many of the political things that they are doing. But in the case of President Correa, uh, he has been able to at least to manage well the economy. Now, it's a different way, the way that he's treating a foreign investment and the way that uh, it's different in the case of Chavez. Nevertheless, when people ask me about Chavez, I used to say, well, what Chavez? The Chavez with $20 per barrel or the Chavez of $100 per barrel? Because that really makes a difference. The Chavez of 20 or $30 per barrel used to call President Cardoso and say, Fernando Enrique, you are really the master of all of us. Why do you try to talk with President Bush because they don't understand what I'm saying? Well, it's a little different what is the decision of uh, Chavez, you know. And I think that uh, this is both in, uh, an important challenge, but not to say that, Ch that Chavez is not responsible to what's going on. I was in, Ch in, in, in Caracas in 2005, and I asked to talk with the members of the opposition to Chavez. And I met with 16 of them. And those 16 of them told me, Sir, I want to make you clear that I'm here because you invite me. Because with this gentleman here, I'm not going to sit anymore together. <laughs> See, and the, and the question that I asked was, are you making your mind if you are going to participate in the next election? And she didn't agree. At the end, nobody participated in the election, and that was because the parliament of Chavez was 100% from Chavez. Now they decided to participate, and, you know, still... We know how the district was done, the, the things that... But at least now you have an important part, the, the opposition. So my impression is that are we going to have in those countries an opposition to that? And in the case of uh, Evo Morales, you have opposition increasing. And in the case of Korea, it's not still the case. But in the case of Chavez, it's the case. Now... What I agree with you, I assume, is that it's also up to the other Latin American countries to keep their voice about what do we mean by a democratic country. And this is an important task. But if that is the case, then a democratic country is many things, among others, what happened with the press and the media. And where you have a very important media group, not Chilean, but the ones told me, Mr. President, I will be happy to be here at your invitation in Chile. But would you be kind enough to get just one, one of the major economic groups that will be <clears throat> welcoming by going to Chile? Just one. You have several you see what I mean? The question between media, economic groups, and politics is a difficult one to address. And if you say, what is the pending task in Chile? The pending task in Chile is to have a much more diversified media of what we have now. But probably this is our fault. It's not, of course, the fault of the media, because the media that we have, they are performing the job of any media, which is fine. The only problem is that when you make a confusion between analysis of the facts, then you wish to have a, a media like the one that you have in this country. And that's another part, you know of the similar equation. So I, I know that the answer that I give you is not clear cut because I put a mix, you know, because at the end I told you about the, 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 
how these models in some countries are not such a good model. And, but the question is that, that is part of the story. Once I invite the major economic groups, when you are president, everybody will go to talk with you, and I say, I would like to congratulate you because you were so successful in the last bit that you had in Brazil. But let me tell you, you got the credit to buy that new firm in Brazil. Oh, yes, Mr. President, we got credit in Wall Street. In Wall Street, in Wall Street, oh, how would you have? Can you tell me, what was the risk that you paid for the credit? The Brazilian risk or the Chilean risk? Oh, of course, the Chilean risk. We are a Chilean firm. Then what part of what you bought it in Brazil belongs to the Chilean government? <laughs> because after a while, the Chilean risk is so many things, among others, you see? And, and, and once I remember in one of my State of the Union, with regard to the question of the private sector, I say the subsidy implicit that you have get from the government has been so much money, because I calculate what is the median risk of Latin America and what was the median risk of the Chilean economy. And since they have the advantage of being able to go to Wall Street and get it really cheaper, then for those Chileans trying to make bits in Brazil was a little advantage to get credit as a Chilean rather than as a people in Brazil because the difference in the country. In short, I think that all those things have to be put together to, to analyze how much democratic is this country or the other country. But I agree with you that the trend in some Latin Americans, and you forget to add uh, Nicaragua to that, <laughs> is uh, rather uh, at least to worry about. But in many cases, I think also that the internal situation explains what's going on. But anyhow, each country is quite specific in their own terms. But I guess that is up to the other Latin American governments to make also uh, a cause for alarm when they are the things that you describe. Thank you for your question. I think you will agree with me that uh, we have been greatly blessed by having you here, and I'm glad there is a life after presidency. <laughs> We've all learned, and we can certainly tell that your economic, political, and just teaching credentials are unblemished. So stay at it. We thank you from the bottom of our heart, and I thank you, Mac, for being with us. And now, if you would like to purchase a book, I think it's right outside the door, isn't that right? Right out here. And there will be a reception following this, but I think the President will sign a few books if uh, you bring them promptly to the table. And so I thank each and every one of you for uh, participating. The Inter-American Dialogue feels very, very fortunate to have had this program and to have had President Lagos be our guest. Thank you.